name is Mark Payne. I'm a climate scientist at the Danish Meteorological Institute here in, in Copenhagen. And I'm also the scientific coordinator of our Klima Atlas, the Danish National Climate Atlas. And what I'm going to be talking to you about today is some work that we've been doing in collaboration with Ghana and the Ghana Meteorological Agency. And in particular, the idea of whether we can take the climate service that we've developed here in Denmark and apply it in another country um, such as Ghana, and in fact, in an entirely different context. Um, and to, so this is essentially a tale of, of two climate services um, that we're going to be talking about today. But to start with, it probably makes sense to actually define what, what actually is a climate service. It's a buzzword that you, you may have heard, you may not have heard of, um, but what actually do, do we mean by it? There's a lot of different definitions, but the, the way that I like to sort of uh, communicate it and, and think about it is that it is essentially a, a way of conveying climate information. Um, society has lots of questions about what climate change will mean for it. This could be a city, for example, that is worried about uh, cloud bursts in the future. It could be a, a owner of a, a house, for example, near the water that wants to know how big the dike needs to be to protect their house. It could be a hospital that needs to, or an emergency service that needs to plan for, for heat wave uh, people being uh, admitted to hospital due to heat waves. And so they take all these questions that they have, and they take them to the climate science community. And unfortunately, the, the, the questions and the, the answers that climate science deliver aren't necessarily the, the most useful um, in the most useful form. If you look at the IPCC reports, for example, they deliver nearly 11,000 pages of fantastic science, but they say very, very little about Copenhagen or about Amsterdam or Antwerp or wherever it exactly may be that you find yourself and where you need to do uh, climate adaptation. At the same time, many of the variables that come directly out of climate models are in terms of abstract quantities like temperature, whereas a health authority is obviously interested in how many people that will actually affect. And the volumes of data involved are, are simply massive. Behind the most recent IPCC report, there's somewhere between 15 and 30 petabytes of data. So that's a, a 15 with 15 zeros after it. This is not just something that you download and put into Excel and start working with in your, your local district town hall. Um, and so quite simply, the, the climate data that we have is not the same as the information that society needs to start thinking about adaptation. Climate services are an attempt to bridge this gap. We, what we try to do in a climate service is to translate uh, the science and the data that we have into information that can support society's needs. But straight away, when you look at this diagram, you can see that there is actually a potential problem coming up because the questions that society has over here on the, the right hand side um, very much will drive the climate services that are being delivered. But a different society will have different questions. Um, obviously, sea level rise is not that interesting for Switzerland. Um, so the climate services therefore become very, very tailored and very focused on the community that they're, they're targeted to. But this also makes it really hard to translate work done in one place, in Denmark, for example, into another setting such as Ghana. So the question that I'm going to talk about today is, can we take a climate service that we've developed in one region and use it in another? And to what extent can we actually transfer these climate services? And to start with, I thought I'd give you a little bit of a background about our own climate service here in Denmark. It's called Klima Atlas, or translates directly as Climate Atlas. Um, and it's the national Danish National Climate Service. It's funded by a grant from the central government and the national budget in 2018. And the goal on, in Klima Atlas is to provide an authoritative and uniform data set that can be used as the basis for climate adaptation in Denmark. You can go into our website here, klimaatlas.dk, uh, and explore and start to, to look at what climate change means for Denmark. The website is almost exclusively in Danish. Uh, and that's because 
our main goal and main set of users is our Danish citizens and Danish government authorities. Uh, but if you run it through Google Translate, it actually works extremely well and uh, you can get a very accessible version of the website. So when we got this money from the central government back in 2018, the first thing that my colleagues um, did was rather than sitting down and writing code and, and diving into the data, they were actually went out and did the right thing and actually talked to society and to people. And the reason for that is, is that Clear Atlas is not a scientific project. We're not trying to write papers and understand new things. We're trying to meet the information needs of society. And that requires as scientists that we actually come out and talk to people. And that's actually what you can see in these pictures here with various workshops that we've had in the last uh, couple of years. And this is a process that we did right at the very start, right in the middle, and it's a process that is ongoing all the time. It's a key part of our work is this dialogue with society, both listening to people, as you can see over here on the left hand side, and you can see if you look closely, you can see me also up talking about climate change and what it means on the larger scale and on the local scales. And so only then when we've got this good understanding of society and society's needs for climate information, can we actually start to think about processing data. So what do we actually do in Clean Atlas? Well, the start point for our, the, the data flow is actually with the, the large global circulation models that sit behind the IPCC reports. And these are fantastic models. They do amazing things in describing the climate, but they're also very coarse. Um, they're typically 100 kilometer resolution. And if you try and see Denmark on it, you can see where these three or four little pixels right there. Um, and unfortunately, these models can't say very much useful about Denmark. But fortunately, we also have regional climate models. And through the Cortex project and the Euro Cortex project, we actually have much higher resolution runs over a limited domain. And so suddenly you can see that Denmark starts to actually look a little bit more like the country that we know. What we do in Clean Atlas is we use this data as our start point, combine it with our understanding of society, uh, together with our own measurements and data from, from DMI, from the Meteorological Institute, to produce a data product that goes all the way down to the, the local scale over Denmark. And once we have this, we can then actually start to zoom in on specific municipalities. I've chosen Lemvi Commune, which is all the way up here in the northwest of, of Jutland. It's a small commune, it's 20,000 people. Um, and they have many challenges about climate change. Um, and fortunately, they're actually able to go into Klima Atlas and then extract some of the many different products that we have uh, that can actually be used to inform their decision making. Uh, we present our data as graphs, as Excel spreadsheets, as tailored reports for this commune, as well as the map viewer that you can actually see here uh, on the display. And then this is actually used as the basis for adaptation planning in Lemby Commune. This uh, report that I have here, um, this report here is actually the green action plan for Lemby Commune. And if you dig down into it, you can find our data sitting there. And that actually leads to adaptation actions like this wall, the sea wall here that you can see in Lemby Commune that essentially protects the, the town from the from storm, storm surge flooding. And that is designed at the end of the day based on, on our analysis, amongst other things, of course. Clean Atlas is also used not just in, in Lemby Commune, but it's actually used at the national scale. Essentially, all 98 municipalities in Denmark use Clima Atlas in some form as a basis for their adaptation planning. And it's also used at the national scale. The government in Denmark recently released its first national climate adaptation plan. And I've taken a, a couple of screenshots from the uh, from the plan here. And what you can see is right here in this table, data directly from Klima Atlas. So we can say that quite legitimately that Klima Atlas is very much the basis for adaptation planning in Denmark today. And so we can really see essentially the, the value chain that's created in this work. We're starting from society, climate model projections and our observations. We produce Klima Atlas. This leads then to an adaptation plan and to planning and ultimately to action on the ground. And the most important thing 
then is that we don't do this once, of course. This is an iterative process. We repeat all the time. This is a constant ongoing process. And so then the question becomes, is this a generic model? Is this something that we can apply? And to what extent can this be applied in other settings? And the reason that we've come to ask this is actually in relation to Ghana. Ghana, if you're not uh, familiar with it, is a, a country in West Africa. It's uh, around about the size of the United Kingdom in terms of land area, it has a population of 35 million. So it's about half the size of the United Kingdom. Um, it has, Capital is Accra, it's population 2.2 million. And Ghana is most famous for as the um, one of the two major producers of cocoa, which of course fuels all of our chocolate ad addictions. And it's really good cocoa too, I should add. Uh, the reason that we've got involved with, with uh, Ghana is actually that the Danish Foreign Ministry and the Danish Aid Development Agency called Danita actually have a very active collaboration with Ghana. Ghana is a, seen as a low to middle income country um, and is also seen as one of the uh, success stories in, in West Africa. As part of this, uh, this collaboration that's been set up, um, it's been set up in the form of a, a strategic sector cooperation agreement is the, the technical name. And the idea is that this is a capacity building agreement and it's actually focused on particular sectors. One of the sectors that Danita is focusing on is actually meteorological data and the idea of, in particular, with a focus on, on early warning systems, um, but generally with capacity building within in meteorology. So this picture, you can actually see the signing of the collaboration agreement between Eric Asserman here on the, the left hand side. He's the director of the Ghana Meteorological Agency uh, of my director, Marianne Turing. And on the right hand side, we can see uh, Sylvia Anou, who is the Ghanaian ambassador to Denmark. And so this agreement was signed about a year ago. And so one of the first steps that we then took was we actually uh, went on a mission to Ghana. GMET also came up here in December last year. Uh, but then we went on a, on a fact finding mission to, to Ghana in, in February earlier this year. And this was a very, very important exercise because it really helped us um, as scientists working in, in a Western modern meteorological agency to understand the, both the cultural aspects and the working conditions and, and the limitations of what was actually possible, as well as, of course, the issues. And these are some of the snapshots that I, I've sort of taken from that trip. So the first question that needs to be asked, uh, it's, probably, it's actually worth, worth mentioning that the reason that we've chosen to focus on a clima atlas is that uh, the Ghana Meteorological Agency at the moment doesn't have any form of, of climate service product, but this is a, a very clear need for it in society. And so when we talked about what aspects to prioritise climate services were taken out as, as a key wish from the Ghanaian side. So the question then becomes, are we able to think about implementing a climate atlas in Ghana? If you think back to the recipe that I described, we need three ingredients. We need a societal understanding, we need a set of model simulations, and we need some observations if we want to copy what we've done in Denmark. Well, the societal understanding is something that can both be gathered, and of course, it's something that GMET as an institution embedded already in the Ghanaian society has a very good understanding for. So we have that aspect. We also have simulations. We actually, in the same way that we have the Eurocortex regional simulations, there is a similar set of simulations that cover Africa. Um, and so these are actually already available to be used. And there's also a set of observations. Uh, this picture is of uh, taken on that particular tour. This is Richmond, who is the head of their um, the Ghanaian uh, department that's responsible essentially for observations. And on this map, uh, that you can see there's uh, around about 150 pushpins documenting the, the location of the observation network, some of them stretching back 150 years. So there's a, a large amount of data there. But of course, when you dive down a bit further into the details, it's not quite that easy. And here's the first problem that we encountered, data availability. It might be that they have a vast amount of data, but this is what it looks like. 
It's in the form of handwritten logbooks and vast shelves of handwritten logbooks. Um, and so one of the first things that we actually need to do is, is have a focus on digitalization and data recovery, data rescue, getting it into a format where it can actually be used in a modern uh, data analysis and, and context and, and climate service. The second problem is one around technical limitations. The Danish Climate Atlas runs on our own servers and we at the moment take around 70 to 80 terabytes of, of storage space. That is nearly an order of magnitude larger than the available disk space at, at GMET. So there's simply not enough space to store the data and work in the way that we do in Denmark. At the same time, there's also massive issues around bandwidth. And the bandwidth at, at GMET is extremely limited. I did a rough sort of calculation and came up with the number that to download 69 terabits, terabytes um, over the GMAT connection would take around about three years, assuming that nobody else at the Institute is doing any work and assuming that there are no power interruptions, which are, are also a major issue. And then, of course, we have to remember that this is also uh, work that's going on in, in the global south, where resources are limited and we can't actually use the code that we've written uh, directly for the Danish Climate Atlas because it's written in MATLAB. And the cost of MATLAB licenses, as you may well know, are rather high. So there's also uh, problems encountered there. So one of the ways that we've chosen to solve this problem is essentially by moving towards an open source model. And we've started an open source project that we've called CAPI, Klima Atlas in Python. And the idea is, is that we actually approach this as an open source project where we take advantage of both technologies such as OpenDAP that let us limit the amount of data that we need to download, as well as Python um, and the X-Array toolboxes that do everything we need to in a free open source setting. By running it in open source software sort of configuration, uh, Denmark and Ghana essentially become equal partners in this project as well. So improvements that are made uh, in Ghana benefit Denmark and improvements in Denmark benefit Ghana. The idea is, is that this is we see as a very good way to, to have everybody able to contribute and, and gain uh, the benefits of the work that's been done. So we were actually back down in Ghana uh, again for a second visit three weeks ago at the start of uh, start of the month. And there were two things that we aimed to do on this. The first was actually we were involved with the first uh, stakeholder workshop that uh, the Ghana Met Agency held around climate issues. And we can see many of the, the, the stakeholders that participated in this workshop over on the left hand side. Um, on the right hand side, we also tried out the first version of our, our new Kapai tool. Um, and uh, you can see this is uh, Peter on the left and sorry, David on the left and uh, Peter on the right. Um, working the three of us working in the server room. And I was particularly glad to work in the server room because even though it was extremely noisy, it also had air conditioning, which was a definite advantage when it's 30, 35 degrees outside and very humid, having come straight from a Danish autumn. Um, we also have some initial successes that have come out of this particular trip. And you can see here the first results that we were able to, to get for projections of annual mean temperature in Ghana. So you can see time starting from 1950 all the way up to the end of the century. Left hand side, we have the annual mean temperature. And we have two emission scenarios, a high emission scenario here and a low emission scenario that agrees with the Paris Agreement here. And so we can see that in a high emission scenario, we expect around about four degrees of warming in Ghana, uh, which is actually a bit higher than Denmark. Denmark's around about three and a half on the, uh, at the end of the century. And we also see there's a spatial map and there's actually quite a bit of spatial variability. The coastal plains along here we expect to, to warm much less than the, the northern parts of the country where we are, are getting up to four, four and a half degrees of warming. But the most important thing is not actually the results. This is very much work in progress. Uh, the th important thing was that this is data 
and analyses that have been done in Ghana on Ghana hardware by Ghanaians. And we are able to do all this for just one gigabyte of data transfer. And that's really, really important. This is essentially a, a really nice proof of concept that just by rewriting our code and taking an approach that's tailored to the, the needs of, of uh, the local institute, we can actually achieve very, very useful results without many of the, the technical limitations I've talked about. What have we learned from this process? Well, I, I draw out three initial lessons. The first is that it's really, really important to assemble a team. And this is uh, can be difficult sometimes. It sounds so simple, um, but it really can actually be very challenging to, to actually get the, the, enough people together um, and to actually establish the um, both on both sides, actually, of the collaboration and to bring in all the necessary expertise. And particularly with the the distance, the geographical distance, that's been very challenging to actually bring that team together. Also, given the, the weakness of, of Internet connections and you can imagine the difficulties of how difficult it is to work online with people anyway, when there's good Internet connection, when one part of the, the, the team has a, a very limited Internet connection, it becomes very, very difficult. But fortunately, we've actually also been quite lucky that part of the stakeholder uh, the sector collaboration agreement also has um, a, a former employee from the Danish Meteorological Institute, Kim Sarop, who you can see here, is actually um, now stationed in Accra at the Danish embassy. And he has a very, very valuable role to play as a go-between. And essentially, he can provide the personal contact and the, the close collaboration with people in person that, that we sim simply can't uh, do remotely from Denmark. And I would struggle to see how this project could actually fly without Kim's presence. We've also learnt, in addition to the, the obvious issues that I've highlighted, that there is a, a really tremendous need for better services that are tailored to this type of application and to the global south. The Copernicus Castata store, for example, has tremendous potential um, to be able to do on the fly processing and do the the processing of this type of data in Europe and on high capacity uh, servers so that you minimize what needs to be downloaded to the global south. But our attempts to, to get this to actually work in a way that is useful for the global south have, have really not failed and have really not worked. And I really think there's a, a tremendous amount of potential, but the, the data store has yet to live up to that yet. Uh, so to sum up, what we've uh, learned from our experiment in transporting a climate service to, to Ghana is that we can not really share the service itself, but many of the concepts and the experience that we've learned uh, are really, really valuable. And that's where we actually have the ability to, to contribute. And, and to help Ghana with the development of this project. And at the same time, there are some basic backbone data process and analysis aspects that can potentially be transported if you design them correctly um, and, and to design them to work within the limitations of, of an institute such as in Ghana. We also have all the, the necessary pieces. And as I've shown you, we've we've had our first set of results and our proof of concept, but there are still many technical and practical challenges that remain. And the way that we're aiming to solve this is through the idea of collaborative and, and open source projects that can essentially be to the benefit of everyone involved in the consortium. So with that, um, I hope you found that interesting and I would be very much like to try and answer your questions and your queries. And thanks for your attention.